Hello everyone, I hope you're all keeping well, healthy and happy. In this video, I thought I'd do something a little bit different. I thought I'd talk about masculinity. It's a strange sort of subject to talk about, uh, especially in a, in a time and in a climate where uh, masculinity is seen as something abhorrent or um, is, is, is seen as non-important or whatever else, right? There's all kinds of people out there that would tell you that there's such a thing as toxic masculinity, which is a garbage idea, right? There's a lot of people that will want you to hate yourself if you're a man, basically. This is a similar kind of thing is actually true if you're a woman as well, by the way. But let's focus on the men here for the initial part of this video. So, in my experience, there are two types of masculinity. The first type of masculinity is from what I've seen through evolutionary psychology and the articles and studies that have been published within that particular um, discipline, as well as uh, evolutionary biology and so forth. The first type of masculinity is biological. Okay, this is the uh, this is where your will to act comes from as a man. The, the 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 call to action, as it were, the the thing that inspires you to do something, uh, we could call it courage, okay, because it certainly is a courage is, is definitely a part of it. The courage to act, actions, right, your actions, and those are of course driven by your biology, by your hormones, by uh, the amount of testosterone you've got in your body, by. Uh, a myriad of other chemicals and uh, genetic predispositions to things. All of that plays into it. Uh, the levels of aggression and so forth, right? That's that's all biological. And that's authentic, true masculinity, right? And it's very healthy. Contrary to what a lot of people will tell you as a man, these are healthy things. And I'll tell you why they're healthy later on. But there's a second type of masculinity that has emerged over time uh, due to the, the what's called the female imperative, as it were. And this second type of masculinity is what I refer to as hypermasculinity, right? This is the feminine ideal, idealized archetype of what they believe a man should be, right? So it's the women's expectations of what a man should be. And these are damaging, I think, to men. They're profoundly damaging if we adopt those uh, and internalize them because so many young men were raised by single mothers. Uh, so many young men have been given really bad advice by their uh, um, sisters or their mothers or their grandmothers or uh, their female friends, right? Uh, you get told all kinds of nonsense, basically about how to actually be a man or a good man or all this sort of junk, right? None of that is true. That's all idealized because it's from their perspective. And that's hyper-masculinity hyper in a nutshell as far as I'm concerned. It's socialized and ingrained into people, into young boys. And they're told that this is what it means to be a man, right? So you can't cry, you can't show your feelings, you can't um, do this or do that, right? Um, uh, all, all of these various aspects of that are profoundly wrong. I mean, uh, to use a basic example, in case you think uh, I'm wrong about this, let me let me share this with you. So back in the Victorian era in the UK, there was a, 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 a sort of a tradition, if you will, where boys used to wear pink, right? Because pink was seen as a very masculine color. And this was socialized into the men of that time. Now, if you fast forward to today's age, if a guy wears pink, he's seen as feminine or effeminate or uh, all these various other things, right? Why is that? Is that because his biology has changed? No, it's because this socialized and greened uh, expectation has changed. And so we have um, allowed for that to 
to become accommodated in our society, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Now, the essence of the man hasn't changed. A Victorian man during his time, whether regardless of whether he was wearing pink or uh, blue or black or whatever, whatever, whatever other colors were around, was still seen as a very, very masculine man, right? Uh, if he was in tune with his biological masculinity, right? And again, what is biological masculinity? Well, it's courage, it's action, it's a, it's a will to act. Uh, and, and these things all stem from the way that we evolved as a, as a species and certainly as a gender as well. Because going back all through human history, about 250,000 years in total, give or take with Homo sapiens sapien, we men were the hunters, the providers, the protectors. Um, this is what we typically did. This, this was our role within the um, family unit, you might call it, right? Or the social unit uh, that we found ourselves in. And that is still very much a part of our DNA today. We haven't changed all that much, right? We haven't really changed uh, as, as much as people think we have just because of uh, the advances we've made in technology. The underlying biology is still the same. Albeit we have increased our intelligence, we've increased our abilities, we've increased in knowledge. All these things have certainly advanced. It's not that they haven't. But with that comes the faulty notion that therefore biology does not matter. Well, it plain well does. It absolutely does. Now, way back when, before we had these comfortable lives that came with all the advances in education and technology and so on and so forth, warm houses and heating and um, the ability to cook things and uh, cars and autom automation and... Um, Com computerized living before all of these things we were primed and we had evolved to face real dangers that were around us back when we were living in jungles or caves or whatever else right because there were very real predators that would attack the human species right there were animals out there that would rip you apart in seconds if you turned your back and so a man was constantly alert and on his guard in, in, in attempting to um, uh, protect his offspring. Or the woman who he had chosen as a mate who would give birth to his offspring. Interestingly enough, women developed some very uh, unique defensive capabilities as well as a result, right? But again, back to the men. So... Men, through time, because of these threats, were designed almost, if you will, by evolution to encounter very real threats and then neutralize them, right? Uh, now these threats were not only from uh, predators, but other tribes, other men, other uh, civilizations um, uh, that, that were always around. And this is why you find um, this sort of constant um, uh, war, if you will, through human history. Uh, although it's become more prevalent and more dangerous in much more recent years, again, because of the advances in technology. So... Fast forward to the current time, and those threats don't exist anymore because we've eliminated most of them using technology, right? We've eliminated them. We have constructed houses, very warm, safe houses. We've constructed roads and streets and pavements and cars and uh, you name it, we've done it. Uh, aircraft, all, all kinds of things. And so we live in, in, in very safe surroundings, right? Now, the thing about that is, nature doesn't intend for any species to live in complete safety, ever, right? We've bucked the trend 
That's what's actually happened. Humans have bucked the trend. Because if you look at the way evolution behaves, it, uh, it, it, it by itself, nature by itself, has created these uh, particular checks and balances, these challenges to uh, all species. Uh, some are predators, some are prey. Some predators are the prey of other predators, right? It's, it's all designed, this uh, uh, circle of life, let's call it, right? It's all designed to challenge the living organism. And the challenge helps it to strengthen and grow and develop, right? Now, that's true of, of virtually any species. Take a look at humans. What have we done? We've eliminated all these natural challenges, whether it's the harsh environments, whether it's the uh, natural, natural predators. Uh, we, we've eliminated these threats. And so therefore, we're, we were no longer, we were too comfortable to put it bluntly. We're no longer faced with real challenges. Uh, th that's the case for most of us, at least anyway. And the other thing that nature does quite remarkably well, actually, is to kill you if you are weak. Okay? If, because the way, see, nature has a very basic intellect to it, right? There's a, there's a basic intelligence to the whole damn thing, to this entire system uh, that we live within. So if a particular species or a particular member of a particular species cannot um, take on the challenge that's presented to it, so let's say um, a deer is, or, or a, a, a pack of deer or antelope are being hunted by lions, whatever deer's the slowest gets eaten by the lions. Right? Whichever deer can't outrun the lion, can't outmaneuver it, gets eaten. And this is a frequent occurrence. And this is the way that nature maintains its balance. Population control. Natural population control. Right? And what's happened with humans? Well, we've eliminated that. We, we have uh, taken all of nature's threats and, again, neutralized them completely. So... Uh, the weakest in our society now survive, right? Because we're not social Dar Darwinists, at least most of us aren't. Uh, we'll come to something else that's profoundly important in regards to this discussion with regard to masculinity as well. It's related to it. But um, th this idea of challenging the human organism is central to our development. And we just stopped doing that. We stopped challenging ourselves. And what's happened as a result is that people have gotten weaker as a result, right? Now, I'm not advocating social Darwinism, not by any stretch of the imagination. What, I, what I'm saying, though, is that due to the lack of challenge, see, nature is very clever. It's more clever than people think in some regards. It's a basic intelligence but it always finds workarounds, right? So if it couldn't kill us by uh, having predators attack us because we became more proficient at hunting them, right, the, thanks to our technologies, then it will develop other types of biological organisms like um, diseases and so forth to try and kill us, right? Bacteria and diseases and viruses, and then we found ways to neutralize those as well through, again, technology, right? Uh, we developed a, a sound understanding of chemistry and we totally eliminated um, virtually all diseases and produced vaccines and did this and did that, uh, pharmaceuticals and whatnot. And that's a good thing, right? You'd think automatically that's a good thing, but here's the thing with that, right? Now, we've again, we've got no challenges, and what's happening in, in more and more cases is that these mental um, disorders that we're all developing, 
whether it's depression, whether it's suicidal thoughts and tendencies, whether it's uh, uh, chemical imbalances in the mind, as we say, those are another way through which nature is trying to kill us. Okay, If it can't kill us from the outside in, it will kill us from the inside out. Because guess what? You are a natural organism. So if nature can't manipulate those uh, external factors, then it's going to start messing with whatever's inside you. Whether it's mental, because your brain is just an organism. Keep in mind, it's a very unique and interesting organism. Uh, some have uh, stipulated it might be a, a holonomic processor, but that's neither here nor there. It's still wet, gooey stuff in there that's made of organic material, right? Um, and your body is made of organic material as well. Uh, from various uh, bacteria and uh, various uh, cellular organisms, right? And these are subject to the whims of nature. They truly are. So you are subject to the whims of nature to, to a greater or lesser extent. And as I say, this is nature's way of trying to figure out how to select the weakest and remove them from the gene pools, as it were. Right? That's literally almost what's going on here. Uh, now, nature, incidentally, is almost synonymous with female imperative, right? And here's why. Because if you look at nature and how we've uh, sort of uh, picturized it archetypically, how we've imagined it, we tend to call nature all kinds of very strange things like um, mother nature, right? Or um, we talk about mother earth, right? What is that? What does that mean? Why are we referring to nature as a female archetype? Why are we doing that? Why are we transposing that uh, psychologically and uh, on, on many other levels? Uh, why are we saying that nature is feminine? Well, it's, again, it's not that difficult to figure out because women, and now we'll go on to women for a second and then we'll get back on to men. Women are more in tune with nature. Right, that's that's just a, a biological fact. They truly are. Nature is unpredictable. Women are unpredictable, right? Nature is the driving force. We even call it natural selection, for goodness sake, right? And in 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 women, they are the sexual selectors that determine which genes from the male populace carry on in the human species. It's a pretty simple thing. And of course, there, there there's a myriad of other things that come into it. Uh, the fact that uh, women's cycles are, are inextricably linked with uh, lunar cycles and, and so forth. So the, the, there's a lot more to this than, than, than people realize, that, that uh, joining of these two archetypes, the feminine and, the, uh, and what we define as nature, right? And if nature, therefore, is designed to test us, now let's get back to the masculinity question and the issue of how men uh, perceive things, then women equally are designed to test you. It's literally that simple. Now, women do this all the time to determine the best mate they can possibly choose from. They do it all the time. So uh, this is why in the manosphere, for example, uh, where, where guys talk openly about these really strange things we're seeing in society right now between the genders and when it comes to men uh, and the unfair ways in which society is treating them. This is one of the reasons why uh, women put guys through what's called a shit test, right? Because... A woman, a woman is the embodiment of nature, genuinely. It is, they are designed, right? Nature itself is designed to test you, and so are women. If you have any women in your life, you'll see this. She will test you, no matter who she is, whether it's your mother, your sisters, whether it's your wife or your significant other or your girlfriend or uh, whoever else, your, your own daughters perhaps, will test you. They're testing, Right? 
They, they test you to your limits to some degree. And this is the reason behind it, because they are acting on behalf of nature. Right? And that's a good thing. That's the way it's supposed to be. But the problem that's happened is that with all this hypermasculinity that we were talking about earlier, where women are the ones that define what men should be, well, men lose, if they're not careful, men lose, because of the way that they're socialized, their inherent biological instincts, their inherent um, intuition. You see, this is the thing. If you're told that masculinity is toxic, you'll end up hating yourself for simply being masculine, right? For wanting to protect and to um, uh, act with courage and be brave and do all those things that are necessary as a man. And we'll, we'll get to what those ultimately ended in a second, which is very positive. But the point be that if you drive all those things out of a man, then that man becomes uh, mentally damaged. And this relates to, I think, the epidemic of male suicide as well, right? Because men are committing suicide at an, at an astonishingly high rate, men and boys, right? And one of the worst things we're doing, one of the worst things we're doing is we're teaching boys or rather, women are teaching boys that there is a particular way they have to be in order to be men, which they don't understand because they're not men. And then the boys grow up all messed up. They don't perform well in schools. You see this bias kicking in even in schools where female teachers, as has been shown in studies by uh, Philip Zimbardo, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Zimbardo, uh, he demonstrated that uh, women have an inherent bias by, by way of which they favor female students over male students when they're when they're teaching so you see this is the thing this, these are very complex things that are happening in society at large and this gender war is therefore very real but the antidote to it isn't um Hypermasculinity is my point. That's just another facade there that's put there for you to think that's what masculinity is, right? And it's you're told that by women. That, that's the problem, right? Like if again, if 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 you live up to this ideal of a, uh, a muscular, uh, weightlifting man, right? Then that's masculinity. Right, that, that's that's what gets put into men's heads, boys' heads. That this is what it's all about, and it's not. I'm not saying don't lift weights. I lift weights. Right, that's what I, I, I enjoy doing. That, but I'm not doing it because I want to uh, look good specifically for uh, every woman out there. I couldn't care less about that. Right. What I'm doing it for is for my own health, so that uh, I'm more capable in the will to act should it arise should a situation arise I'm, I'm physically readying myself for any potential threats just like prehistoric man right the point being that we're teaching boys all the wrong things and we're teaching women all the wrong things as well Right? So we're no longer teaching boys that they have to be courageous and stand up for their values and their principles and, and protect their families and protect their spouses or their loved ones. We don't teach them that. We don't. And what's happening as a result? Well, society is collapsing. Okay? On, on, on a social level, society is falling apart because of this fact. Right, Because men are not embracing their masculinity. There is your problem. And it's being driven out of them because of an ideological uh, campaign that's been waged on them by, uh, again, uh, leftists primarily, radical leftists, feminists, uh, subverted feminism, uh, all these different uh, forces, which have unfortunately combined to damage uh, society at large, right? 
It's the same thing with Islamism, by the way. Islamism, people think this is all, uh, like, with Islam, it's, it's, it's a feminine, sorry, it's a, it's, it's a very male-dominated religion, right? And, and, uh, all of this other nonsense. But what Islam actually does, interestingly, is that it uses the same concepts of socialized masculinity, hyper masculinity, which are which is not true masculinity, right? And it indoctrinates kids into the sick religion, which is predicated on abuse of others, right? It's predicated on that, and women seem to have a predilection for that. They really, I mean, I might get in trouble from a lot of people for saying that, but this is a fact. You look at the sales of Fifty Shades of Grey. And then the number of women that watch the movie and its sequel. And you tell me that I'm wrong. Okay? Because these are things that are buried deep inside the female subconscious. Because women are always testing for the dominant man. They don't actually, strictly speaking, necessarily want to be dominated. Although there are some women like that out there. Perhaps there's a lot of women like that out there, I don't know. Uh, again, judging by uh, Fifty Shades, right? But um, they're actually looking for, and, and this is the thing, the subconscious, uh, their subconscious is designed to look for the most dominant guy in the male dominance hierarchy. Not necessarily to subjugate them, but to, to, to show them that he's the the leader of the pack, the alpha male, so to speak, right? That's what that's what I I think is happening in the subconscious minds of women. And because we're not telling guys this, we're not telling men this. They're failing horrendously in in every avenue because uh, they don't challenge women. See, women want to be challenged. This is another thing, right? Nature itself wants to be challenged. And, and let me put this into context for you. I might be talking about too many things here, right? But here's the thing. So nature, as I explained, wants to kill you. That is its nature. That is what it's there to do, right? It, it, it wants to kill you. But we are constantly, as a species, challenging nature. We're challenging it and we're saying, no, we're going to live. So if a, if a lion threatens us and attacks us, we've got two ways of beating nature. We can fight or we can flee, right? And both of those can work quite successfully, right? So um, the point being that uh, we are beating nature when we're doing one of those two things, right? Because again, nature does need to be challenged. We are anti-entropy machines, Right? All living creatures are. And what we're doing just by living is we're challenging nature, you see. And this um, complex dynamic is what allows life to uh, continue to exist. Right? And, and this is nature's way of, of, again, determining the best genetics who should be allowed to carry on and continue. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it's not just men that are suffering from this flawed, nonsensical indoctrination, you see. It's women too. Because we are t telling women in this messed up society that they shouldn't embody their archetype. And what is their archetype? Well, nature creates life because women mirror nature. Then women create life. Women become the caregivers of life. Women exhibit compassion, empathy, and nurturing. Right? That's the basic predisposition of women. And yes, they can be vicious as well. Right? Equally vicious as men. And, and that is their, in their DNA because, not because they're evil, not by any stretch of the imagination. Men aren't evil and women aren't evil. Right? This is some garbage that, that again, the ideologues have tried to shove down people's throats. Right? That we're all evil somehow just for being us. No. Right? 
if, if we're embodying, embodying true masculinity and true femininity, then that's not evil, right? If women are embodying compassion and caring and nurturing, great. If they're embodying, embodying their viciousness in order to protect their offspring, great, right? Because that's what they're designed to do. So, and men are designed as well to do uh, things like that, like protecting their family and, and um, uh, hunting uh, for food and, um, you know, uh, facing down any predators and, and eliminating threats. That's what we do. So, we shouldn't feel embarrassed about that or ashamed of that because that's our... That's part of our DNA. It's part of our biology. But what are we t teaching women? Don't do that. Tr become more masculine. Become more vicious. Why? Is that helping them? Is it healthy for them? No. It's just like with hypermasculinity. We're, we're putting all that wrong garbage information into them when they're little girls and we're teaching them all this crap that makes their life a hundred times harder than it ever has to be. And, and vice versa, we're making boys' lives harder by feminizing them. By using this uh, false facade of hypermasculinity. We're damaging them. We really are damaging them. You see? Because it, it weakens people. It weakens... Women become weaker within themselves because it exhausts their inner um, energy, their inner... Um, uh, radiance and strength that goes from them when they are socialized to do manual labor and hard work uh, the hard work that men do for it for example right and most women don't like being in that sort of environment some women thrive on it just because again according to individual dna and hormones and things like this maybe maybe some women thrive on for example excelling in the business world reaching the top heights and uh, being uh, enormously uh, competitive. But in the case of most women, uh, they do find that exhausting. They do. And, and you need only look at uh, the example where a woman went undercover as a man. Uh, I think she was a journalist. I can't remember her name right at this point. But she went undercover as a man in order to work as a man and try and experience life from a man's perspective. And she had a complete nervous breakdown. So, and, and we're seeing that on, on, on a mass scale right now with women. We really are. And with men, we're seeing, we're seeing the, the, a similar phenomenon where, again, the suicide rates are through the roof. What is that all about? What is that all about? Well, it comes down to this simple thing, right? See, as a man, here's what real masculinity is. It's, it's not that complicated, and it doesn't involve, you know... Um, growing hipster beards or uh, weightlifting or whatever else, uh, whatever other hyper-masculine nonsensical ideas were put into your head as a kid, it doesn't, it doesn't involve that, right? Here's what it does involve. Is taking responsibility. Taking responsibility for what? Well, for the safety and the continuing existence of your family right your family um and yourself also because if you can't guarantee your own safety you're not exactly going to be any use to anyone else right so you have to be as a man capable of taking care of yourself being able to survive the challenges of nature and those in this day and age come more from within yourself, not externally, right? They're not external threats, they're internal threats. And those are the ones that you have to face. All these uh, things within you, psychologically perhaps, that, that young men face, where they experience this feeling of wanting to give up and, and just, you know, throw in the towel and kill themselves or whatever else, you need to snap out of that. Because that's nature trying to eliminate you from the gene pool you're, you're in this as a fight as a challenge to continue to live 
So that's the first thing you have to do is take care of yourself. Find a means and a way through which you can do that. The second thing as a guy that nobody will probably ever tell you is that you will be alone in confronting all of the challenges that you find in life. You will be alone. You will be shouldering the majority of the responsibility yourself on your shoulders and not only your own responsibilities, but again, the responsibilities of others. And that's a tough gig. That is a tough gig for men, right? And a lot of guys panic because of that. And they get scared because of that. Rightly so. Because it's a terrifying thing. It's a terrifying thing to have to take on immense weights. The burdens of other people. The responsibilities that come with that. That is terrifying. Why shouldn't it be? Right? It should scare the living daylights out of you. If you have any sense. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? Because that's where courage comes in. See, courage is all about that. It's all about facing down your fears. And your fears right now in this day and age are all about being responsible. Yeah. People are, kids, young young men today are all afraid. They're all afraid of what other people will say about them, right? Or, or what their uh, parents will think about them, what their mothers will think about them, what their, uh, you know, uh, wives will think about them, what their spouses will think about them. You can't go through life like that. You cannot, because that is extreme weakness in the face of nature testing you. Okay, so you have to find the courage. You have to do it. And there'll be days when you don't feel like doing it and you'll feel like you just want to crawl behind a rock and cry. Those days will happen. Well, they happen to us all, men and women alike. We all, face, we all face that. Because we're all, don't forget, women are also, along with men, trying to challenge nature. Even though they are archetypically the embodiment of nature, they also, because they are living, right, a living creature, are being tested by nature. So we're all trying to live. We're all trying to keep surviving. We, we, want our, we, all, we are all trying to keep our genes surviving. And man, is that tough. Man, that's a tough gig, right? And again, nobody will tell you this stuff. And they won't tell you it because they don't know it. It's not out of a sense of evil in most cases, right? I mean, there are some mothers that are inherently evil. Don't get me wrong, right? But they're few. They're few in number. In most cases, it's just the fact that women don't know what a male child, in most cases, needs, and in order to exhibit that courage that we were talking about, you have to develop discipline within yourself. You have to develop courage. You have to develop strength, uh, mental strength. You also have to develop a, a, an almost near fearless state where you're not afraid of death either. Because here's the thing. A guy with a lot of courage... Right, A guy with uh, bag loads of courage and all the other things that we were talking about that are masculine traits, who's a protector, a provider, you, you call it what you want. All of those things could potentially get him killed. Okay? And so if he's afraid of death every minute of every day, well, you're finished. You're finished because your life becomes that of the undead, right? You long for death at that point. That's what happens. Your inner spirit gets um, stale. See, to keep going as a guy, you, you do need to be that fearless about death. And yes, here's the other thing about that, right? Here's the thing about all of that. 
Every individual, when they become courageous, has a 50-50 chance of surviving this life. Because guess what? The threats are real, right? If you're afraid that people are going to socially ostracize you for being principled or for speaking your mind, you're 100% right about that, by the way. It's not that you're wrong about that. If you're afraid that, um, you know, your spouse will leave you for that, yeah, that's probably going to be a, a real possibility, right? But, again, the thing is, in the long term, in the greater scheme of things, it actually pans out, right? Because... If you happen to be in that half, because we said it's a 50% chance whether you live or die, when you become uh, someone who embodies the masculine archetype, the courage, then there's a 50-50 chance that, that you live or die. So if you're in the 50% of people that survive, guess what? Your genes get to continue. They always do for those kind of people. But if not, then you're finished, right? Then you're finished. That's why we have all these, interestingly enough, the, the things I've just detailed and outlined are probably why we have these mythos through human history embodying the heroic archetype or embodying the trickster archetype or and all these other uh, male archetypes we've got and also the feminine archetypes as well there's a reason why uh, the prince has to save the princess right and scale the walls i mean there's again a whole number of levels to that but there's a reason why we have those stories right there's a reason why we believe in heroism And all of that is basically to say that, that, that your biology, as a guy, if you're a guy, right, your biology is what you need to listen to. Not any of this socialized garbage, right? Not any of this stuff that tells you, oh, you, you shouldn't be manspreading or mansplaining, right? And all this other stuff and uh, toxic masculinity, right? You need to put two fingers up to all of that. Because it is all nonsense. And it will that will get you killed inside, at the very least. And then you'll probably kill yourself as a result of that. Right? So don't do that. Um, and it will also destroy your life if you go with false ideas. Right? That have been created by people probably far smarter than you who understand social science and who understand hypnotism and who understand how to manipulate entire societies into doing their bidding, right? Which is where a lot of this comes from. Uh, I kind of have touched on this briefly, but uh, the Frankfurt School and uh, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci and uh, all these um, individuals, the Fabian Society, all these institutions, all this socialism, communism, Marxism, cultural Marxism, Islamism, feminism. The isms go on and on and on. It's all designed, all designed to manipulate you into believing lies. The postmodernists, right? All of that is to get you to ignore your inner biological drive. Whatever that might be. Your own inner aptitudes. And I'll end it on this. Whether you're a man or, the, or, or a woman is, is not really... Uh, that's not really the, the point of this. The point is that you should go with your own intuitions every time. Your own inner instincts. That is what you need to follow. If you have an aptitude for science, whether you're a guy or a girl, follow it. If you have an aptitude for healing follow that if you have an aptitude for the sciences follow that right whatever it is that your by your own biological drive inclines you to do that is what you need to be doing 
Perhaps there's creativity locked up inside you. You've got to put that out there. And doing that also, by the way, requires courage, right? Because people might ridicule your art. People might ridicule your creativity. In fact, there's no might about it. They will. <laughs> they absolutely will, right? And you've just got to st stand there and go, okay, carry on. Say what you've got to say, right? You basically have to be a little bit like an Abrams tank. If you're a guy, especially, you have to be like an Abrams tank. You're going forward and going forward and going forward and you're driven, driven, driven. And all these things are being thrown at you, right? And you're being shot at and uh, people have got anti-tank missiles even, right? And they're shooting at you. And you just got to keep on going. Your job is to take all that fire. Your job is to take the fire of society, right? And all the terrible things that people are doing and saying and say, and you have to aim as straight as an arrow and keep going based on your own morals, ethics, and principles and courage. You, that's what you have to do. And it's tough. And I'm not telling you it's easy. Of course it's not. Life is not easy because you're battling nature. You're battling nature just to keep living. But nature wants that. Nature wants that challenge. Women want that challenge. Everybody wants that. Other fellow guys want that challenge, right? Guys love it when they're challenged by other guys because it gives them an opportunity to hone and enhance their own skills, at least if they're strong enough within, right? You increase your skills each time and you become... You become stronger as a result of the challenges. That's my point, you know. So don't give up on yourselves and always have faith in your inner being. See, the people out there that are the manipulators, the master manipulators, the master minds, right? They want you to give up on yourselves. They want you to believe in the very worst about yourself. I want you to all believe in the very best of yourselves. Every one of you. Because there's great goodness as well as great terribleness in all human beings. And you can exhibit that and embody that. And don't ever listen to anyone who tells you otherwise. Because they just want to bring you down to that level of being in the ditch along with them. They just want to drag you down. Don't trust them. Trust yourself. Trust your inner light. Let that guide you. Let it inspire others. Okay? Anyway, that's all I've got to say for this video, I think. I hope that that has been somewhat useful, at least, to some of you. I'm not sure. Because I was just sharing my thoughts literally on a whim. Um, but I hope you got something out of that. And I want to thank you very much for watching this video uh, because these long ones, uh, they can be pretty tough to sit through. But uh, thanks again and uh, God bless you.